G'day everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm the Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Economics Academy, our first one. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Canberra is Ngunnawal country and sovereignty was never ceded here. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to extend a welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So uh, obviously there are huge things happening in Australia's economy at the moment, the first recession in many decades. And we at the Institute thought it was really important that we include as many people in the economic debate as we possibly can. And that's why we decided to launch Economics Academy and we're delighted that you're all here with us today. Uh, more than 4,600 people have enrolled and we want to thank you for your support and for your interest. Um, as I said, we think this is really important while some of the biggest economic decisions are being made in our nation that people feel equipped to participate, to challenge um, and to really get stuck into the economic debate. So over the next 10 weeks, we'll be releasing every fortnight a video tutorial explaining some of the basic principles of economics. Those videos will be published at, uh, on our website at nb.tai.org.au forward slash economics underscore academy underscore one. I'm going to put that in the chat in just a sec so you can click on it. Uh, and every fortnight we'll do one of these webinars where you'll have the chance to ask Richard and sometimes Matt questions directly if you've got questions from that video tutorial. And we'll also delve into... Um, a topical economic debate that's uh, currently in the news. So the first video tutorial, hopefully a couple of you have had the time to uh, watch it, is what's the point of economics and the science of the efficient allocation of scarce resources? Um, if you haven't watched it, don't panic. We're not going to foul you out of Economics Academy. Um, we want everyone to succeed here. Uh, and so you can just watch it later. That'll, that'll be totally fine. Just a few tips before we begin to help make sure this all runs smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions. Um, and you should also be able to upvote questions and make uh, comments on other people's questions. If you use the raise your hand function, I'll call on you directly and you'll see an icon beside your name. That means you've raised your hand and I can call on you and you can ask your question directly in the second half. And lastly, or not lastly, Keep things civil and on topic in the chat, otherwise uh, I'll boot you out. Some people have said that they find the chat distracting. If you click on it, it pops up as a separate window and you can minimize it or put it to the side. And lastly, this discussion is being recorded and if for some reason you miss this or any of the future webinars, they will be recorded and they'll be put on that homepage for Economics Academy. So doesn't matter if you miss a video tutorial or a webinar, you always will have access to all of the Economics Academy content once you've enrolled. So uh, most of you already know Richard Dennis and he doesn't need an introduction, but I, I'll do it anyway, just in case some of you are unfamiliar. Dr. Richard Dennis is the Chief Economist at the Australia Institute and the former Executive Director. He's a prominent economist, author and public policy commentator. He's a former Associate Professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU, and the author of several books, including Econobabble, Curing Affluenza, and Dead Right, How Neoliberalism Ate Itself, and What Comes Next. Matt Grudnoff is the Senior Economist at the Australia Institute. Matt has previously worked at the Australian Bureau of Statistics and at the Department of Climate Change, and he's published widely on a diverse range of subjects, including tax that we're talking about today, labor economics, energy economics, and climate change. Um, and today we're going to discuss the economics of the income tax package that the government has mooted that it will bring forward in next week's budget. Uh, and then we're going to move to questions that you all might have from the tutorials or indeed on the tax cuts. So in the first video tutorial, um, we did talk about the economics um, being the efficient allocation of uh, scarce resources. And Matt, we didn't, we noticed in that uh, video that fairness isn't really mentioned anywhere in that. Um, often, uh, you know, fairness of taxation is in the eye of the beholder. 
But before we kind of get into the big picture on tax, can we start with the specifics of the income tax cuts package that the government is planning to bring forward? Who benefits from these tax cuts? Who are they targeted at and how much will they notionally cost? Yeah, so the government's talking about bringing forward its tax cuts that it's already legislated. Um, and um, these were ones that were legislated a year or so ago. Um, and in particular, they're talking about bringing forward stage two. So stage one is already in, that's the Lomito. Some of you uh, out there might have got a tax refund um, at the end of last year when you submitted your tax return. That was probably part of, part of that was the Lomito. Um, and this um, stage two that they're talking about bringing forward is mainly for high income earners. In fact, we, we did some research and we did a paper that shows that uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the tax cap goes to the top 20% of income earners, of taxpayers. Sorry, um, and, just repeat that, 90%. I just, that's astounding, so. Yeah, and, and the bottom half, the bottom 50%, half of all Australian taxpayers will only get 4% of the tax cut. So it's overwhelmingly going to the top end. Uh, and, and that's because um, it's mostly um, increasing tax thresholds at the top end of the scale. Um, and so, Matt, um, it's really targeted at uh, wealthier Australians, but you've also done some research kind of breaking down amongst those wealthy Australians um, of those who benefits. So I'm thinking there in particular, if you can just tell us about the difference between how much men will get from the tax cuts yep. compared to women. Yeah, so um, because men are more likely to be high income um, and because this tax cut just overwhelmingly goes um, to high income earners, unsurprisingly, it mostly goes to men, wealthy men. Um, in fact, for, for every dollar of the tax cut that women get, men get over $2, so more than twice the tax cut that women are going to get out of this. And that's because they're far more likely to be in the top tax um, scales, they're far more likely to be in the top 20% of income earners. And so, Richard, I'll come to you next. Um, Matt's talked there about some of the detail, but big picture, the government is really floating these income tax cuts um, and bringing them forward as an important part of its stimulus measures, given that we're in um, a recession. So can you take us to the big picture here and unpack why they're making that argument? And can you explain to us why tax cuts that are targeted at wealthy people actually make quite a poor economic stimulus. Yeah, thanks, Eb. Um, so big picture, of course, you know, we've just gone through the biggest reduction in the size of the economy, the biggest reduction in GDP that we've seen in modern Australia. So GDP, gross domestic product, total amount of stuff, total value of all the stuff we made fell 7%, 7% last quarter. So How does we, that compare to other kind of downturns, do you know? Well, the, the 1991 recession, for example, over, over three quarters, the GDP shrank by one and a half percent. So if, if the 1991 recession was one and a half percent, this one is more than four times bigger, seven percent. If the 91 recession was a wave that hit you at the beach and knocked you off your feet, imagine a way four times bigger coming and crashing into you. So statistically, this is an enormous recession that we're experiencing. Now, what does that mean? It means that a lot of people have lost their jobs and they're not spending in the economy. It means a lot of people who haven't lost their jobs are worried about the future. So they're hanging on to their money rather than spending it. And it means a whole bunch of companies uh, that might usually be investing to make their factory bigger or to install some new equipment to gear up for an increase in production, the private sector is actually saying, well, now's a terrible time to invest. We're going we're gonna to hang on to our cash. So in an environment where unemployed people aren't spending, employed people are spending less than they otherwise would, and the private sector is spending less than it otherwise would, the, all this talk you hear about stimulus what that is, and it's, it's literally, it's, it's one of the most uncontroversial things that economists could agree on in a situation like this when the private sector isn't spending, it makes enormous sense for the public sector to say, well, if you're not going to spend, we will. Now, while almost all economists agree that that sort of stimulus, that an injection of additional money into the economy is good, 
in terms of shortening the recession and flattening the recession, where economists disagree and where politicians disagree and where humans disagree is how best to shape that stimulus. So if we agree on the size that we're going to spend hundreds of billions, tick, pretty much everyone agrees we should. I for one would say, well, if you go and spend that money in, in creating, directly creating jobs in labor intensive industries, education, health, childcare, disability support, uh, if you spend the money directly creating jobs that need doing, you will create a lot more jobs than if you give high income blokes like me a tax cut and say, now, Richard, you've got a tax cut. Hopefully you'll go out and spend that money and hopefully you'll spend it on something labor intensive and hopefully that will lead to more job creation. So Richard. tax cuts, sorry, just very quick. Tax cuts are a stimulus and spending is a stimulus. What we're arguing about as economists is which is the most effective. And Matt's data shows why uh, tax cuts are not an effective way to stimulate the economy. Yeah, so before I go back to Matt, I just want to kind of um, highlight something that you've said there. So tax cuts are a stimulus, but perhaps not the most effective one. Um, what you're really talking about there is certainly for individuals um, and, the, and the tax cuts targeted at wealthy individuals, is that idea of trickle down economics that's been debunked. That's Absolutely. really what we're talking about there, right? The idea that it will just eventually filter down to everyone else. Absolutely. So, so let, let's be clear. If the government spent a uh, million dollars employing uh, 20 people on $50,000 a year to work in aged care, a million dollars spent, 20 people getting the job, we know exactly how many jobs will be created. And then when those people get their pay, they go and spend that on whatever they want to spend it on. So we get what's called second round effects. When the government directly spends on labor intensive services, we know what's going to happen. We know it's going to create jobs directly and we know there'll be flow on effects. But when you give Richard a tax cut, thank you very much. Very kind of you. Oh, actually I don't need any more stuff right now. I think I'll just pay off my mortgage a bit faster. Or also, I think I'll... There's a recession on, so you're a little worried. You know, the yes. Australia Institute might be thinking, let's get rid of Richard because we're running out of money, <laughs> so please donate. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, not only joking to the donate. But, like, during recessions, we expect people to save more, and we've seen that in the national accounts just recently. The, the, the savings rate was about 5% before uh, the recession, and it's jumped to 20%. It's, it's quadrupled. Um, and that's not unusual. Um, and, yeah, and that I mean, makes that makes sense, less doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it, Matt? Like, you're in, you know, what feels like very precarious and uncertain economics times. If you can save a bit more money, that's a, a rational choice. Yeah, if, if you're worried about losing your job, then what are you going to do? You're going to pay down your debts, you're going to save away just in case the worst happens um, and, and you don't have a job. Um, and, and that's what people do in recessions. So during recessions, when you want stimulus, tax cuts are less effective because when you hand them out, particularly to high income people who have the capacity to save and pay down debt, um, they're less likely to spend it, which means, and, and, and stimulus that isn't spent is wasted stimulus. It doesn't stimulate at all. Yeah. Um, Richard, I'll come back to you quickly. Someone just asked in the chat, why doesn't trickle down economics work? Like what's the problem at the, at the heart of that concept of leveling, letting it all just uh, showering it on the top and letting it all trickle down to the rest of us at the bottom? Yeah, look, good, good question. Um, the, 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 I guess there's two questions is, does the data say it works or not? And the data says it doesn't work. All right, so lots of people have tried trickle down economics, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, all around the world, we've tried it here in Australia. So after people have tried it, did it work? No. So that's, that's the empirical part of economics. The theoretical part is why not? You know, so we've got to separate what we know. Is there strong evidence that trickle down economics works? No, there's lots of evidence that says it doesn't. Why doesn't it work? It's a theoretical conversation and economists argue about these things. Uh, but one of the main reasons it doesn't work and certainly doesn't work as well as spending money directly is what I said before. If the government just went out and employed 50,000 people to work in aged care and healthcare and disability care, 
if the government went out and directly employed those people tomorrow, we know exactly what the minimum number of jobs that will be created is. The money doesn't have to trickle to them. We gave it to them in exchange for them performing an important function. But after we give the money to the people who we directly employed the, and directly created jobs, which is what everyone says they want to do, after we've succeeded instantly with, with no mechanisms in between, the people we employed go out and spend the money. And guess what? When they go out and spend the money, that'll trickle down or trickle around or trickle, it'll trickle somewhere, right? So if, if we go and employ a whole bunch of people on minimum wage who are currently unemployed, I guarantee that they'll go and spend most of the money we give them. So when we employ people directly, when the public sector gives cash to humans to do important work, we immediately get what we wanted and the salary trickles on to someone else. But when we just give Richard a tax cut, I might spend some of it and I might choose to spend some of it on something labour intensive. So when you give me a tax cut, you miss out on the direct employment effect. And if I'm above average income, if you give me the tax cut, you're giving it someone to, who's less likely to spend it than if you gave it to someone uh, on minimum wage who was previously unemployed. And just to confirm, like the number one thing that a government wants to do during a recession is lower the unemployment rate. So direct employment and, and getting that money in there is is really where you'd expect it to be targeted if lowering the unemployment rate is your number one goal. Exactly. And people say all the time that it's all about jobs. Well, I, I disagree. Like there's no evidence it's all about jobs because if it was all about jobs, we would see the government doing exactly what I just said. All right. So it's easy for governments to say it's all about jobs and then hand money to people they like giving money to. But the fact that they said it's all about jobs before handing money to their favorite groups isn't proof that it's all about jobs. And I think what, and you know, the Australian Institute's done a lot of work on this through the crisis. I just keep coming back to it. If governments were obsessed with creating jobs, then every time they made an announcement about job creation, they would be saying the reason we chose to give it to this industry is that we compared what the job benefits of giving it to this industry would be to all the other industries and this stacked up the best. But yeah, they, never, I mean, they never say that. And one of, one of the industries that's really quite uh, job intensive is, is um, in universities, teaching at universities. And that's one of the industries they, they seem to have deliberately avoided giving um, support to. So, you know, while we're handing out money to the construction sector, which actually is, is relatively capital intensive, capital intensive economic term, it basically means that it doesn't employ a lot of people, it uses machinery rather than people. You know, if you, if you go and you're teaching at a university, that's very labour intensive. That uses a lot of people. So they're, they're, they're focusing their money on capital intensive industries and not labour intensive industries. Um, before we move on to questions from the audience, because there's quite a few here, um, Matt, we released a paper on tax and wellbeing today. Can you just take us through uh, briefly some of the findings from that paper? Yeah, so this paper basically came about because um, the, the government, um, or, you know, generally there's been a debate where, where people talk about um, that, that uh, tax is a, a handbrake on the economy, that tax is a wet blanket on the economy, that uh, Tony Abbott famously, when he was Prime Minister, said, um, no country has ever taxed its way to prosperity. So what I did was, is I went and found data for all the countries I could. I, in the end, I got about 188 different countries, and I looked at their tax to GDP ratio, which is a measure of how much tax they have compared to the size of their economy. And I looked at various measures of well-being, things like average income, uh, life expectancy. Uh, there's a thing called the Human Development Index, uh, which, which takes together a whole heap of things done by the UN, um, and even happiness. And I said, well, you know, if, if um, tax is a handbrake on the economy, you would expect that high tax countries would also be low growth countries and would have smaller economies. They'd have lower average income, they'd be less happy, they'd, they'd have worse health outcomes, uh, lower life expectancies. But what we actually found was the reverse. Um, the most happy countries in the world are the, the Nordic countries, 
Um, and the Nordic countries are also some of the most high tax countries in the world. And if you graph all of the countries of the world, you see that as um, their tax to GDP ratio goes up, as the level of taxation in the economy goes up, they, they're, more, they're not only more happy, um, they're also healthier, um, they're also more well-educated, they have lower levels of inequality, but most importantly, if, if you're an economist like me and Richard, and you're only interested in, in money, um, then they had higher average income. That is, higher tax countries were more likely to have higher average incomes. And so the idea that, that tax is a, is a handbrake on the economy, that it's a wet blanket on the economy, is, is completely false. There's no evidence for that at all around the world. Um, so we might move now to questions from the audience because there is a whole bunch. Um, Jan Kossar, if you are on the line, uh, I'll come to you next. If you didn't mean to raise your hand, uh, perhaps remove the raise your hand function. Uh, but the first question I've got here, um, I think might be quite a quick one. It's from Nick Piper. Why are tax cuts for the wealthy still so popular then? Is there any good economic <laughs> proof for it or is it all spin, Richard? Oh, uh, well, look, I, I confirm what Matt said. It's a wonderful paper he's written. The data in there is overwhelming, uh, overwhelming uh, that uh, higher tax countries uh, the best perform have the best performing economies in the world and, it seems, the, the happiest, healthiest societies in the world. Uh, why does putting more money in the pockets of a small number of the wealthiest, most powerful people in the country have <laughs> enduring appeal? Hmm. Um, <laughs> let me take my economist hat off here for a second and speculate that self-interest does uh, often drive uh, a lot of policy in Australia. And, and worse than that, uh, you know, Australia has some very well-paid politicians by world standards. All politicians are in the top tax bracket. Um, you know, if, if you're a high-income male who hangs around high-income males a lot, you might convince yourself that, you know, you're kind of normal and average and you could do with a bit of a break. So... Is there good economic evidence that tax cuts will, will help the economy? No, not at all. Um, what I find more interesting and, and more confusing is how, how do politicians get re-elected offering tax cuts when 90% of the benefit goes, as Matt said, 90% of the benefit goes to the top 20% and only 4% of the benefit goes to the bottom half? You'd think in a democracy, people would organise, people would discuss with each other and just say, hey, it's a democracy. This is a crap idea. Let's all speak up about it. But the reason that we're putting on webinars like this, the reason that we want more people to understand what economics does say and doesn't say about these things is that for decades in Australia, voters, serious people who take democracy seriously and they read the papers and they think about things, they've just been told again and again that tax cuts for high income earners will lead to economic growth and without economic growth, we can't fund health and education. So I think a lot of people who won't benefit from the tax cuts believe because they've been told for so long that the tax cuts will end up helping everybody. Now, if that were true, that would be an interesting debate to have. What's the best way to help everybody? But given that, as Matt said, there's no good data to support it, why we do so much work at the Australia Institute is to say to people like you watching today, you've got to call bullshit on this stuff. You know, there is no strong evidence and, and we as voters, we as citizens have to ask simple questions of politicians and demand simple answers. Where is the evidence that they'll create more jobs with tax cuts than they would with spending more on health and education? It's on them to convince us. We don't have to understand all of the macroeconomics that sit behind it. They are supposed to understand it and they should be able to point to the evidence they're relying on. And I'll bet you pounds to peanuts they can't and they won't. Um, we've got nearly 1500 people who are on the line with us today. Thank you all so much for joining us. This is our first Economics Academy uh, webinar. I've just posted a link to Matt's tax and wellbeing paper in the chat. And to those asking, uh, yes, we will try and save the chat so people can access it. Gail Davies, are you there on the line? Can you hear me? Yes. 
Did you have a question for Matt or Richard? Well, I didn't. Um, I was just finding the chat very distracting on my screen, but I worked out how to move it. So no worries. Now I can see Richard's lovely face. <laughs> <laughs> thank All you. All right. For it's no a great worries. Initiative. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question I've got is actually I'll might take a few of these and uh, and. Um, uh, we'll just address them. There's a number of people asking here about modern monetary theory. Um, that's not a topic that we're intending to get into in this semester of Economics Academy. But if you check the Australia Institute's YouTube channel or our webinar page, uh, you'll see that a few months back we did a webinar with Stephanie Kelton. Um, she wrote The Deficit Myth and is a big exponent of uh, modern monetary theory. Um, she did that with Richard. That's a really good uh, kind of primer on it. And Richard, did you recently write a big essay on modern monetary theory? And where might people be able to find that? As luck would have it, Em. Here's one <laughs> I prepared earlier. Um, look, in this month's edition of the Monthly magazine, yeah, I've, I've written a, a couple of thousand word essay on what modern monetary theory is and isn't about and why it's interesting. Um, and yeah, that's, that's in this month's Monthly. Uh, and I think it'll be, uh, you can get it online or in, in person. Uh, but just very quickly in terms of how it touches on what we're talking about today, a key tenant of modern monetary theory is that governments don't need to literally collect tax in order to literally fund the provision of services. Now, that kind of blows people's minds sometimes, but it's true. And I don't think there are really many economists that disagree with that assertion where things kind of get interesting, and I explore this in the essay, while it's, it's true that governments don't literally need to collect some tax and hoard it in a pile before they can spend it on health and education, that's not how the monetary system works. Uh, the more tax a government collects on our behalf, uh, the more resources can be made available uh, to provide health and education. It's not the money that matters, but if you tax Richard, then Richard has less capacity to go and buy, you know, tables and chairs and coffee. And from a real resources point of view, from an opportunity cost point of view, if, if Richard has less ability to consume real resources, then we as a society can spend or use up more real resources providing health and education and uh, investing in tackling climate change. So to join that back up with what Matt was saying, the highest tax countries in the world, the Nordic countries, collect a lot of tax from their wealthier citizens and, and they consume collectively a lot of resources in wonderful health, wonderful education, wonderful public transport systems. So yeah, the MMT debate, I think is quite interesting. It's true that governments don't literally need to tax the cash in order to be able to afford to do something, but in collecting a lot of tax, what a government's doing is, 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 is taking resources out of the hands of, of me and we're then collectively spending those resources on, on hopefully good ideas like health and education. Um, here's a quick one from Matthew Hamilton. But firstly, uh, Sari Rankin, Alan Barley, John Luca Noble, James Bannon, Marilyn Hoban, Alex Gates, Stu Milne and David Batt. You've all got your hands raised. Uh, lower your hands if you don't want me to call on you for a question shortly. This next question is from Matthew Hamilton and I'll direct this one to you, Matt. Um, and if we can be brief in our answers, Matt and Richard, because we'll try and get through. There's a real lot of questions here that I'd like to get through. Is it true that providing cash to low income earners is more beneficial to the economy as it gets spent immediately? Yeah, absolutely. Low income earners um, spend all of their income. In fact, uh, if you look at the data, the bottom 40% spend more than they earn usually. Um, and so if you give an additional $100 to a low income earner, if you increase the unemployment benefits, for example, they will spend all of that um, just on meeting their basic needs, their, the basic, uh, you know, paying the rent, buy, uh, paying for utilities, uh, going to the doctor, going to the dentist, but they'll spend it completely. Um, whereas if you give it to high income earners, they've got far more capacity to save. And also low income earners are more likely to spend it in their local economy 
um, uh, which also stimulates stimulates the economy. So absolutely, low income earners um, spend more money, uh, spend more of the tax cut, or, or, or you know the, the increase in welfare payments, or however the government gives it to them, um, than high income earners, and it will stimulate or create more jobs. Marilyn Hoban, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. No, I accidentally put my hand up. I'm sorry. I've loved right. it. <laughs> but I'm enjoying this. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Tim Diamond. What's the value of measuring recessions by loss of GDP rather than loss of employment? Richard? Uh, look, there's value in, in measuring both. Absolutely. So both give us uh, some sense of the magnitude of a decline. Uh, so GDP, gross domestic product, total amount, value of the total amount of stuff uh, made in Australia in a 12 month period. Um, measuring GDP's fall gives us pretty timely information uh, on, on what's happening out there in terms of production and income. Uh, but because there's such a strong correlation between uh, employment of people and the making of stuff, if we know what's happening in the labour market, it gives a pretty good idea what's happening in the GDP data. And if we know what's happening in the GDP data, it gives us a pretty good idea what's happening in the labour market. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to measure both. Uh, I think policymakers typically do, but statistically, the way we've defined a recession is two quarters, so two a quarters, three months, so six months in a row of GDP shrinking is the statistical definition of a recession. Uh, so we define recessions in terms of the GDP measurement, but we worry about recessions because of the impact of that on the labour market. Um, this is something we covered in this week's Follow the Money uh, podcast, which I'm about to upload this afternoon. Um, Toby Chalmers asks, Trump was incredibly proud of limiting his personal tax how can the debate shift towards being proud of paying tax for this benefit to society? First to you, Richard, and then to you, Matt. Uh, yeah, Trump wants to make America great again by getting everyone in America to be as smart as him. And if everyone in America <laughs> pays absolutely no tax, uh, I guess that would make them all very smart. And if tax is the price you pay for a civilised society, then uh, America will go to hell in a handbasket. Unfortunately, so much sort of economics has been used to say selfishness is a good idea. If everyone's selfish and pursues their self-interest, then we'll all be better off. Uh, it's not really what the economics textbooks say, uh, but if you take that argument that selfishness is good and if everyone looks after themselves, we'll all be fine, then it makes perfect sense for Donald Trump to think, oh, any suckers pay tax, why should I? But if everyone behaves like that, then, 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 then democracies don't function in the way we're used to seeing them function. So, yeah, it's very dangerous, I think, for Donald Trump to uh, be anything other than ashamed of, of his conduct. The idea that someone who proclaims to be so enormously wealthy and enormously successful has paid so little tax over the years is an indictment, I think, on, on his interest in helping America and an indictment on the American tax system that allows it to happen. So I'm zero for three in terms of calling on people now. So people with your hand up, if you've got a question, I'm going to ask you to type it in the Q&A box, please. Um, Matt, did you have anything you wanted to add to that last point? Oh, just that, you know, tax is an important part of uh, creating space for the public sector to do things. Um, and um, we, it's, it's not just Donald Trump that avoids tax. It's um, a problem for multinational corporations. It's mainly a problem for very wealthy people. The Australia Institute uh, about six years ago put out a paper that talked about a Buffett tax. Um, which basically said um, you could get a certain amount, a certain percentage of your income in deductions, but then um, no matter how many deductions you had, it couldn't be greater than that. And that was basically a way of trying to get around this idea that if you pay a really smart accountant or an accountant firm, you can get your taxable income down to zero. In fact, we did another study that showed that there are a bunch of people who earn more than a million dollars in a year, over a million dollars in a year, and paid no tax at all. So they reduced their tax taxable income down to zero. And on average, those people spend about half a million dollars each on their tax affairs. Half a million dollars in order to avoid paying tax. 
wouldn't it be easier if they just paid tax? Um, well, you know, a buffet rule is one way of getting around that. Um, Matt, this next one might be for you. I've got a couple of people asking, what's the income threshold in, at which someone becomes wealthy or in the, the top 10 or 20% of um, taxpayers? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, so I think that the top 10%, um, you need to be earning up above, well above 100,000. I think it's around about, I'd have to double check, but I think it's around about 110, 115,000. And to be in the top 20% of income earners, uh, or taxpayers, I should say, uh, you have to be earning around um, 90 to 95,000, around that sort of threshold. Thank you. Um, what else have we got? Uh, I think we've answered that one. Okay, here's one from Anthony. Oh, hang on. Now that's gone. I should have clicked on it. Too many people are asking questions. This is great. Yeah, the Q&A is up to happen. <laughs> um, the next question is, where do we go? From Bridget Clinch. Even if you taught the whole country, how does the Australia Institute propose to make the parliament make economic and other policies based on evidence? And how do we overcome the fact that tribalism and brand image determines vote rather than information and evidence? Richard, do you want to take that one? Oh, I'd love to. That's not our job, Bridget. That's yours. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do is put arguments in your hands. Uh, and oh, look, sorry to be flippant. There's no mention at all at all in the Australian Constitution of Evidence. There is no obligation on our elected representatives to rely on evidence when making decisions. None, 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 none. They don't have to do anything. If you want them to use evidence, if you personally would like to express a democratic preference for your elected representatives to rely on evidence, that's up to you. And that's up to your friends and that's up to your family. And, and, and anyone you can influence. But we have to kind of get over this idea that there's somehow some obligation on our elected representatives to rely on evidence to make the decisions they want to make. And, and let's be clear, there isn't evidence to support a lot of important decisions. Um, how as a nation do we decide uh, questions like uh, whether euthanasia should be legalised or not is voluntary euthanasia. Obviously, is that a uh, is that a moral question or is that a question that we want answered on the basis of the value of a human life? How on earth could we do a cost benefit analysis and collect the evidence on whether we should go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan? So, so let's be clear: uh, our elected representatives make decisions all the time based on their beliefs based on their values, based on their assessment of what the people who voted for them want. And that is fine and that is good and that is the way democracy works. Now, if as voters we really want governments to rely on evidence when making distributional decisions like who should get a tax cut, that's on us. We're allowed to do that. And we at the Australia Institute are doing everything we can to put evidence in people's hands. Uh, but it's up to you to make sure that everyone knows that you expect politicians and in fact you demand it and you won't vote for politicians who refuse to put evidence forward to support decisions that you think should be evidence-based. But it might be a strange way to answer the question, but go back to the constitution. There's no mention of evidence. They don't have to do anything. If we want them to do it that way, that's great. But they're in charge, they got elected, and they get to make rules all the time, often just based on how they feel and who they like. Um, yeah, that I takes can just me... add one thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the best tricks that politicians have, have managed to, to do to get around being accountable um, is to convince everybody that they're crap. They have lowered the bar so far that, that when something happens, when there's some kind of scandal, when they're handing out grants to, to you know, obviously political and partisan people, people just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, they're just bloody politicians. Uh, I think we need to actually raise the standard of what we expect from our politicians. Um, and you can't do that if you think that all politicians are crap all of the time. And that, again, that's a really odd sort of way to come at it, but it would be better if we thought more of our politicians um, and we expected more of them and we didn't just dismiss when, when they behave badly. 
Um, I'm going to come to a question from Alan Bali next, but that does take me back to the actual video tutorial. And I was really struck when we were taping that, uh, when, you know, you kind of wrote on the board, Richard, that economics is the science of the efficient allocation of scarce resources. Matt, uh, I think one of you pointed out that it doesn't say fair anywhere in that. Um, what, what is the importance of fairness and when does fairness tend to come into some of these economic debates um, compared to say when we're talking about tax cuts? Um, well, fairness is, is really, really important, but um, what you need to understand is, is that economics doesn't do fairness. So if you want to dis have a discussion about fairness, then um, economists aren't necessarily the people you need to talk to. If you want um, resources efficiently allocated, then economists are a great group of people to talk to. I think the problem is, as a society, we've actually gone, well, you know, we want economists to answer more questions than they probably should. Or more importantly, that, that um, politicians basically say, well, the economists say that the most efficient way of doing it is this way, so therefore that is the only way that we can do it. Um, and that issues of fairness, issues of equity, other issues, um, just shouldn't come into it. And that's simply not the case. And, and one of the main points that Richard and I want to make through this, um, this uh, Economics Academy is when, and, um, when, when you should listen to economists and when you shouldn't listen to economists, when you should ignore them and, and go and do what you think is right or fair um, and make an argument for it being fair rather than making it an argument for it being efficient. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, think of it this way. In, 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 in Australia, we build holiday homes for the holiday homeless before we build <laughs> houses for the homeless. Okay? And, yeah. and from, an e from an economic point of view, that's obvious because builders build things for people with money in their pocket. Yeah. So if there's a holiday home shortage, a builder will take that a lot more seriously than if, if there's a shortage of homes for very low income earners. So it's not the builder's job to do fair, right? It's the builder's job to go and build stuff for customers. But the way an economy works like ours is that the customers aren't people that need things. The customers are people who want things and who have money in their pockets to back up their wants. And that's why the tax system is so important because if we don't redistribute income from those with the most to those with the least, we can't be at all surprised that builders or bakers or anybody else won't provide services to low income earners because the way capitalism works is you need dollars in your pocket to turn your, your, your physical need into what economists call demand. And without the dollars, it's just a wishing. And, and markets don't respond to wishes. We will get into market failures in a future tutorial. So keep oh, that yes, in we mind. <laughs> um, this question is from Alan Barley. He says, the history of directly creating full employment with large infrastructure and social projects was learned after the last depression with Roosevelt's New Deal. What happened to government's corporate memory? And will a Green New Deal or something similar uh, from advocates in Australia or elsewhere get to prime time? Richard, I also wanted to ask you to reflect on, you sometimes talk about the fact that you're unemployed during the 1991 recession, and you've talked about the program that I think Barbara Pocock was involved in designing to try and get people into work. Do you want yep. to take that one? Yeah, so not only does history tell us that, you know, government spending is a great way to create jobs, uh, the Scandinavian, the Nordic countries tell us that. It's not like lost in the mist of time. Like we <laughs> did it and it worked. They're still doing it and it works. Still works. Still works. <laughs> Never stopped in some of these countries. So it's kind of us that's changed. It's us that's failed. And it's us that needs to relearn these things that some people never forgot. But yeah, look, I, I finished university uh, in 1991 in the middle of the little recession we had then. Uh, and it was terrible. I, I applied for, I think, 180 jobs with no success. Um, you know, we, we have this, so neoliberalism's trained us to blame the unemployed for unemployment. And we're trained to sort of say, oh, the unemployed must lack skills or the unemployed must lack uh, determination or the unemployed must lack some wherewithal or some other bullshit word. Uh, so let's, let's think about that. We have a recession and unemployment spikes. 
does anyone think there's an outbreak of unskilledness? You know, does, is, there, is there a sudden surge in apathy and, and that's what drives? No. What happens is there's a shortage of jobs. There's, because people aren't spending money, employers aren't employing people to meet their demand. And uh, yeah, back in, the, uh, back in the 80s and back in the 90s, uh, the government had all sorts of Commonwealth direct employment programs. And yeah, Barbara Pocock, one of the directors of the Australia Institute, was literally in charge in the Hunter Valley of calling on the community to bring forward ideas uh, for how they might create jobs by doing something useful and, and coordinating that task. So local councils, local community groups saying, this is a task that needs doing and with a little bit of money, we could employ people and with a little bit of equipment, they could do this important work. So please pick us because per dollar you spend, we think we can not only create jobs now, but we can deliver things with lasting benefits. So it's exciting to hear people talk about Green New Deals. It's exciting to hear people talk about this stuff, but we have to remember that it's not a new idea and it's not lost in the midst, in the mists of time. Yes, Roosevelt did it very well. Europe's still doing it. And in the Hunter Valley where I grew up, uh, this was done with enormous success, you know, in, in my lifetime. So, uh, so, yeah, we do know how to do this stuff. It is not rocket science. But if we tell ourselves that giving me a tax cut and everything will trickle down, from a government point of view, that's an easy out, isn't it? I don't have to be creative. I don't have to be responsible. I don't have to be accountable. I just give rich people some money and hope it works. Well, there's a harder way and a far more effective way called build structures and systems and policies that require creativity and effort and resolve and management skill and fund them and watch them work. Uh, but neoliberalism says there's an easy way. Tax cuts for the rich, what could go wrong? Well, history says it just doesn't work. The next question is from John Luca Noble. He says, to what extent uh, are economic events determined by governments or random? Thinking there of the Chinese response to the GFC versus the global self-imposed recessions of economic lockdowns. Who wants to take that one first, Matt or Richard? Oh, I'll have a go. So economic events um, are a little bit random. Like they, they, they can come out of nowhere. I mean. Uh, the, the pandemic, you could argue, came out of nowhere. That said, you know, people have been saying for a long time, if you listen closely to epidemiologists and others, that, you know, we were due for one and, and that would have a big effect. But, you know, we kind of ignored them and then it, it came out and hit us in the face. I think what's most important is, is how they respond, how governments respond to recessions. Because there are a number of ways that have governments in the past have responded and they have wildly different outcomes. So uh, in 2008, we call it the GFC. Uh, other, or elsewhere around the world, they call it the Great Recession. And in particular in Europe, what they did was is they had an initial response the way we have responded now with stimulus, but then they withdrew it quite quickly. Um, and what they found is, is, is their economies basically plunged into back into recession. Um, and, and they had a prolonged period where, where they had sluggish growth, high unemployment, and basically misery because they didn't allow the recovery to continue. Um, and, and what the Australian, the economists of the Australian Institute will be watching really closely is, is it's great that the response that we've had, as Richard said earlier, that, that the size of the response is about, right, we might disagree with what they're spending it on, um, particularly if they bring forward these tax cuts, but um, the size of the response has been okay, but it's also the length of the response. Um, if the economy begins to show promise and they quickly withdraw the stimulus and go, well, we've got to go back to having a budget surplus because that's the most important thing in the world, then um, what we'll find is, is the economy goes back into recession and incidentally, the budget goes way back into deficit. Yeah, I, I agree. And just another plug, I've got an op-ed in The Guardian today where I use the analogy of antibiotics. Uh, if, you come or, if you're given a course of antibiotics, they always tell you stay with them until they're finished. And what most humans do uh, is get bored halfway through and feel like I'm better and stop taking them. 
And often what that means is that while you've killed off a lot of the bacteria, you haven't killed it all off and it comes back. And not only when it comes back, the bit that comes back are the antibiotics that are the most resistant to the, 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 the bacteria that come back are the ones that are most resistant to the antibiotic. Well, we, the same I think is true with COVID. You know, there, the, there's been enormous sort of demands from the conservative media to pull out of lockdowns before you get it down really low. And all the epidemiologists are like saying, that's crazy, don't do that. There's no point doing it if you're not gonna push it all the way to the end. Uh, and the same is true with fiscal policy and stimulus. Uh, if the government's done the right thing and chucked a lot of money at this early in the piece, agree with Matt, it's a good idea. But if you start to see some green shoots and tell yourself everything's gonna be all right, if you pull the money out too fast, as the government had been suggesting it was going to do, uh, yeah, you just wind up delaying the recession and coming out arguably the worst of both worlds, all of the cost of the early stimulus uh, and, and a recession nonetheless. Um, a couple, I mean, people will have noticed that a lot of these questions, uh, some of them touch on macroeconomics and a lot of what we'll be focusing on uh, in these, this first semester of Economics Academy is more at the micro level. Um, but we are looking at doing a semester two of Economics Academy next year. Um, so I hope you'll all stick around for that. Um, and the next question is from Tom Ballard, who asks, how can we tax wealth more effectively and fairly in Australia? Um, Matt, I might start with you. Yeah, well, I mean, we used to. Um, it's called, uh, you know, death duties. Um, as Richard, my favourite line from Richard uh, on this is, is when would you rather pay tax, when you're alive or when you're dead? Well, I think I'd rather pay tax when I'm dead. It's, it seems like a good time to pay tax. But, you know, um, death duties are a wealth tax. They're, they're effectively a way of, uh, once in a generation, redistributing some of that wealth. Um, and uh, particularly if you've got good accountants, particularly if the, the rules are set up in your favour, you can avoid um, fairly easily, uh, well, not fairly easily, you can, you can avoid paying income tax. Um, but it's harder um, to avoid paying um, a, a wealth tax, particularly when you die. Um, and, and from an economics point of view, we like taxes that don't change behaviour. So uh, death duties is good because it doesn't change behaviour. It doesn't make people want to die faster. So um, in, that, in that regard, it, it, it's quite a good tax. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I agree. And, and, and put another way, the, the way to tax wealth effectively is to tax wealth effectively. Uh, what we've done in Australia is pretty much take all forms of wealth uh, and, and offer enormous tax concessions at them. Uh, the biggest one is, of course, the family home. And, you know, we have this kind of idea that, oh, the family home is sacred and you shouldn't pay tax on that. Well, someone just bought a $25 million home on the weekend. You know, I, I don't know what that's got to do with, you know, family values or anything else. So we've kind of got this limitless concession on, 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 on family homes. Uh, uh, um, capital gains, so when you buy an asset and sell an asset, uh, if I buy some shares for 100,000 bucks and I sell them for 200,000 bucks, I made a $100,000 capital gain uh, and Matt worked for 12 months to make 100,000 bucks, uh, I would literally pay half as much tax as Matt because we have this top secret thing called the 50% capital gains tax concession in Australia, which literally says income from capital gain gets taxed at half the rate that ordinary income does. Why on earth would you do that? Uh, our superannuation system has enormous tax concessions for wealth. And guess what? Rich people have a lot more in super than low income earners. So pretty much everything about our tax system, everything about our tax system uh, is, is concessional when it comes to wealth. And in Australia, we just think it's crazy talk to talk about having some sort of wealth tax or death duty. And I agree, I'd personally, like really, again, if we lived in a democracy where people understood stuff, who wouldn't accept a tax rate on death in exchange for a lower income tax rate all through your life? Like sign me up today. But the answer is people with billions of dollars who want to hand billions of dollars to their kids, well, they're going to fight tooth and nail against that. Uh, so America has wealth taxes, Europe has wealth taxes, you know, it's, it's not some communist conspiracy, you know, even, even Donald Trump might accidentally end up paying some wealth tax, uh, unless it turns out he is a complete fraud when it comes to his wealth as well. 
Um, I just want to say we've had a bit of a troll in the comments who's being abusive. Uh, we've removed that person from the chat, but unfortunately uh, can't seem to delete some of those offensive posts. But thanks everyone to alerting us uh, to that and they have been removed. Please keep things civil and um, bear with us and, and just ignore that while we try to figure out how to actually uh, delete it. Uh, appreciate all of your patience. Um, we've got a few people here asking about the value of um, a universal basic income. We've only got a couple of minutes in under a minute, um, Richard and then Matt. What do we think of universal basic incomes? Uh, universal basic income suggests that everyone in Australia, everyone, perhaps over the age of 18 or not, depends how you want to design it, uh, gets the same amount of money given to them every week. And then if you want to work and earn more on top of that, good for you. If you don't want to, good for you. So the idea is, look, it's simple. You know, everyone's got enough money to live on and you can get rid of all the complexities of the welfare system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from my point of view, fine. You want to play fantasy football? I can talk about a world that looks like that. Australia could afford to do it if we wanted to. But understand that calling for that today is calling for me on a, on a comfortable income with my full-time job you're saying, I think we should give Richard 30 grand a year. Fine, I'll take it. I'll have it. Um, and, and if you want to push for it, I'm, I'm not going to oppose you. But we live in a society where we haven't managed to increase the doll for 30 years. So personally, I'd rather put a lot of my effort into helping the people who really missed out the most first. But that's as much a political strategy. Where am I putting my effort today versus what's fair? I'm, I'm not good at answering what's fair but I know what's unfair and that's that some people uh, are living on 15,000 bucks a year when they're just on the normal new start or job seeker. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a much as, as much a political question as an economics one. And we should be honest about that. Uh, Matt, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah. Just, just to add to what Richard said, I completely agree with what he was saying. Um, look, if, if you wanted to, if you were interested in a universal basic income, probably the best way, place to start is things like, um, uh, increasing the unemployment benefits so that you're no longer in poverty to, at a poverty rate. So, so if everybody was guaranteed, uh, if you didn't have a job, you didn't have any other income that you had enough to live on and be out of poverty, that's a great place to start. And also uh, at the other end, we wrote a, a great paper uh, a number of years ago at the Australian Institute on a universal uh, pension, age pension. So, you know, these are two, two, um, two areas that you could start with a universal basic income um, and help um, a lot of people who are who are quite poor and, and who really need it. Um, and if that worked out and we wanted to, 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 to grow it or go further, we could. Thanks. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, everyone who's joined us today. It is our first Economics Academy webinar. We really appreciate your interest in it. We hope you like the videos. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar. I'm sorry we can't get to all of your questions, but hopefully we got through uh, a fair few of them. Some of the questions I've left because we will uh, hopefully tackle those in later tutorials and webinars. Um, but we'd also love to hear your feedback on this whole program. Um, we will send up uh, some follow up to get that from you, but we'd love to hear your feedback on how you think this first week uh, has gone. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks Richard Dennis and Matt Grudenoff for your time today and for all of your great questions, everyone. The next tutorial will be on opportunity cost and thinking at the margins. And once again, a reminder, once you are enrolled, as you all are in Economics Academy, you will get access to all Econom Economics Academy content. If you miss anything for any reason, uh, don't worry, it will be available on the Economics Academy homepage. Um, don't forget uh, to make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. And in this week's episode, as I said, I'll be uploading that later this afternoon. We talk about tax avoidance and Donald Trump with Richard Dennis. So just a reminder, stay one and a half metres away, wear a mask if you can, make sure you pay income tax and keep washing your hands. Stay safe out there, everyone. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Em.